How about if we get started? Got new batteries and my cordless microphone. I'm ready to go. This is sort of an unusual circumstance for me. I've never done anything quite like this before. Again, I've talked about everything that I meant to talk about for that first test that's coming up on Thursday. And what I said that I would do today is just kind of give you a Reader's Digest version of everything we've talked about so far. So that's what the slides in the PowerPoint presentation will let me do. And then, you know, I'll just open it up and review session away, right? Any question you guys have, I'll do my best to try to answer. Um, before we start, let me mention a couple of things. Next time we meet on Thursday morning, here in this room, we'll give you guys that first test for the Bio 1120 class. It's going to be 45 multiple choice questions, very much like the one you see in the back of the lecture notes for this class, very much like the ones you see on Pilot uh, for this class. So 45 multiple choice questions. You'll need to bring a number two pencil with you because uh, you're going to be filling in scan cron forms and we'll get a computer to grade all of your exams for you that way. You can keep the exam. <clears throat> in fact, I would encourage you to keep your exam. Take it away. It's your souvenir or memento of uh, the experience you'll have on Thursday. And uh, further, don't just keep the exam. Why don't you mark down what you had chosen as the correct answer on the exam? Because when you leave here, within a half an hour of the end of the class, half an hour of the end of the exam, you'll be able to go online to pilot and see an answer key for the test. And so you'll be able to grade your own test using your copy of the exam probably more quickly then we will be able to have the computers generate the scores and you'll know before I do what your scores are, okay? So keep the exam, bring a number two pencil. I'm gonna ask you all also to bring an ID with you so that you can show us your ID as you turn in your test, all right? Just to make sure that nobody's paying to have somebody come in as a ringer and take their test for them. So bring an ID, anything with your picture on it will be fine. Uh, a pencil and be ready to go. You should not need a calculator. You certainly will not need a cell phone <laughs> or a computer, right? So uh, before the test starts, I'm going to ask you to, if you brought those sorts of things with you, I'm going to ask you to put them away and I don't want you looking at them during the course of the test, all right? That's all that's going to happen on Thursday, is we're going to take the test. If you're done in 10 minutes, get out of here, go away, you know, come back again a week from today for the next lecture. There isn't going to be any sort of lecture, no party, no champagne, nothing going on that I'm aware of immediately after the test. So when you've turned in your exam, you're free to go. So I would bank on not needing more than an hour. You'll probably get some, you know, whatever, 50 minutes of free time after the test on Thursday, okay? I think that's the, the, the logistical things that I needed to convey to you all. I'll say it one more time. I think the single best way to get ready at this point, as well as earlier, is look at some of those old tests. When you look at the old tests, what you should be doing is getting a sense for how it is that I phrase questions. I hope that you, you're comfortable with this idea of my trying to ask you to apply 
the things that we've been talking about as opposed to simply have memorized some terms and some structures. I'm, I'm looking that you have a working knowledge <coughs> of the sorts of things that we've been talking about, at least as best as I can. Uh, there are going to be some questions that are kind of definitions. I don't have any way I can get around doing that once in a while, but most of the questions I'm asking you to apply some sort of insight that I've talked about in class. Um, and when you're looking at those questions, the, look carefully at the, uh, the choices that I give you for the possible you know, correct answer. I think what you'll find is that it's often pretty easy for me to get one of the other choices to be the correct choice just by changing a, a single symbol or a single word in the question. Right? And I love doing that. I derive some perverse satisfaction from students who come to me after the exam and they say, I've been looking at the answer key. I noticed on the practice exam the correct answer was C to this question. Now on this exam's answer key you say it's B. You've made a mistake. And I love it when that happens because I can say, ah, but you see, this year I've asked a different question. I changed it from PH to POH for instance, right? So there's usually just a real subtle thing, and students then who aren't looking carefully and kind of wrestling with each of the questions can get tripped up on that. And I'm, I recognize that this is a, uh, a personal, it's a flaw that I have, that I derive some satisfaction from those kinds of challenges, but just know to not be that person. Look carefully at each of the questions and appreciate that I can change what's the right answer pretty easily, often by changing just one word, or sometimes just a positive or a negative sign, all right? So again, don't bother with a phone. I don't think you need a calculator. I can't understand what you would need a calculator for. There's gonna be some addition, right? So, but I think you guys can handle that without a calculator. You've got an hour and a half or whatever. To, to, you can count on your knuckles and your fingers if you need to. I don't think you need a calculator. No phone, bring an ID, bring a pencil, Take your time when you're done, leave, and take your exam with you, okay? Any questions for me about that sort of thing? Yeah. 45 multiple choice questions, and you got the whole class period to wrestle with it. For me, working up the answer key, I'll have the answer key worked up in about 10 minutes. So, but then again, I think I know what the right answers are. I'm pretty confident what they are. So, you know, the, if anybody turns in their exam in less than 10 minutes, I think they're just winging it and they're guessing, right? <laughs> if, if, I, I would predict about 45 minutes on average for people to finish it. There will be a couple people who stay here to the very last second of the class. <laughs> That's just, I've seen it happen before. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So let's talk about these slides a little bit. There is going to be a special supplemental instruction session. Lauren's going to be sending you an email reminder about that for later today, right, this afternoon. It'll be focused just on getting you guys ready for the test, so feel free to take advantage of that, free of charge, right? And let's get to work. Again, I feel sort of like I'm doing improv right now because I put these slides together last week sometime, and what I did is I just looked at each of the lectures and I pulled off one or two of the images that I thought might help me, might, might jog my memory about a couple of the more important highlight kind of points from each of those lectures. And so my ambition here is to spend maybe two, three, upwards of five minutes on each of the lectures that we've talked through in this class so far. Uh, just to let you know what I'm thinking are sort of the big deal concepts that are in play. And after I've gone through all of these, let's uh, just take any questions that you guys might have for me. So, <clears throat> it all began, what, about three weeks ago, and I started talking with you about what is life, and then we quickly got on to this idea of the chemistry that's associated with life, we started out with small things, getting into subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. Uh, in the context of protons, neutrons, and electrons, I think the, the, there are a couple of important things to bear in mind. 
the number of protons inside an atomic nucleus is what determines what kind of element we're talking about, what kind of atom we're talking about. You can have different numbers of neutrons, and those just give rise to isotopes of the, of the atom that you're talking about. But what governs really the chemistry, what makes it carbon as opposed to nitrogen, it's the number of protons in the nucleus. And then that, in turn, also predicts or determines the number of electrons. And the number of electrons in those shells, you know, level, two or, uh, level one orbital, then moving out to the level two orbitals, it's the array of those electrons that then tells you how many covalent bonds uh, an atom is going to be involved with, and it lets you get a feel for how likely it is for the element to be attracting electrons to it as opposed to dishing them off onto other things. Uh, so again, there's those orbitals that come up. And again, those orbitals in turn tell us something about the kind of bonds that are going to be in play. So in terms of elements, there are 92 naturally occurring elements. There's four of them that are particularly important to living things, making up over 96% of the mass of our bodies and the mass of most living things. The four guys that I think you might want to particularly focus your attention on are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Right? Don't worry too much about the chemistry and the implications of magnesium, for instance. Now, magnesium is an important element. We can't live without magnesium. I'm not meaning to diss magnesium, but if you really want to keep your, a good grip on what's going on for biological systems, easily 96% of the chemistry that's going on is governed just by the chemistry for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and uh, oxygen, okay? And those four, turns, it, it's neat that those four end up being the four that we turn to. One of the reasons we can get away with relying on just those four is that there's so many cool things you can do with just those four. And you can do so many cool things because they give you all four different kinds of valences to work with. Hydrogen likes to make one covalent bond. Oxygen likes to make two. Nitrogen likes to make three. And carbon kind of needs to be involved in four. Right? So for each of those four elements, we have a different number of covalent bonds that those elements like to make and be involved with. And you know that gives you a pretty nice palette. It gives you a whole spectrum of things that you could, could do because you've got each of those four represented. Hydrogen and carbon <clears throat> are pretty well behaved when it comes to sharing electrons. The way I described it to you, as I said, their outermost shell for both hydrogen and carbon, that outermost shell is simultaneously half empty and half full. And that makes hydrogen and carbon just as inclined to give away an electron as it is to bring in an electron. So any covalent bond between two things with the same electronegativity, with the same affinity for electrons, is going to be a nonpolar covalent bond, meaning that the electrons get shared evenly between those two atomic nuclei. So hydrogen to hydrogen, same electronegativity, same affinity for electrons, that's going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. Hydrogen to carbon, it's going to be the same story because they have the same situation. They're both half empty and half full. So these are also going to be, those four bonds there are also going to be nonpolar covalent bonds. Oxygen to oxygen, same affinity for electrons. Two bonds here, notice. Uh, the same affinity for electrons, so that also is going to be, a, this is going to be a pair of nonpolar covalent bonds. And then you got water here where we see an instance where the oxygen is pulling the electrons away from the hydrogens. That sets up a partial separation of charge. The oxygen has a little bit more negative associated with it because the electrons are hanging out there more. The hydrogens are, to some extent, naked protons, just a naked positive charge. So there's a partial positive charge with the hydrogens. These now are polar covalent bonds, polar because there's an unequal sharing of the electrons. All right, so that's my two slides 
for that lecture. Let me pick out two slides for the one where I talked with you about the chemistry of water. I've already started to do that with the water molecule that was on the previous slide. But this outline reminds me that I talked with you about some of the stuff that makes water so very cool. And to a biologist, it's, you know, I like to think that I'm a fairly imaginative guy. I can't conceive, I can't even begin to wrap my head around life in the absence of water. And, you know, as soon as I start going down a path, well, gee, you know, under the right pressure and temperature, you might be able to get, uh, you know, methane to be the solvent. Lauren, I didn't expect you to do an assassination attempt. Man, I mean, one of these guys might take me out, but I, you, you're supposed to be on my side. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can't even conceive of something else at work. If I start to think of something like methane, you know, like on Titan, right, the, the moon of Saturn, if I start to think about using something else, it's like, yeah, that could work. It could be liquid. You could, but wait a minute here, methane, it's going to suck as a solvent. It's only going to work with hydrophobic things. But then, okay, fine, we'll, we'll make the whole, you know, all of life revolve around hydrophobic as opposed to hydrophilic things. But wait, now what are we going to do about temperature buffering? And what are we going to do about cohesiveness? There's nothing else that fits the bill so well as water does because water has that it's a small molecule, but it's rich, it's dense in those uh, polar covalent bonds that just gives it so many neat things that it allows it to interact well with other, it play, water plays well with other water molecules, water plays well with anything that has a little bit of a partial separation of charge or, or a charge associated with it. Nothing else seems to fit the bill that well. I would expect that many of you heard the big news out of NASA yesterday. They were a big party. They were cracking open champagne because they, they feel confident now that there's liquid water, at least during certain seasons, on the surface of Mars. And that was the big news out of NASA yesterday. I was talking with another biology professor. We were walking across campus, and I said, does this surprise you? Was that news to you? Because I thought that I knew that five years ago. You know, and it's just now that they announced they had one other test that they think nails it. It's like, you know, I saw pictures of water running down the side of a crater. I, that was good enough for me. I guess I spent some time in Missouri, the show me state. They showed me a picture. I believed it. That was all I needed to hear. Uh, well, now they're really confident there is water there. And the thinking is that, you know, where, is that, where there is that liquid water, there's a reasonable chance that we'll find something alive on Mars, all right? Because now we can imagine how it is that it could have survived, how it is that it can live in that sort of environment. And again, it's ultimately because water has these features, these characteristics that nothing else can compare to. It's got this great cohesiveness that lets you have things like capillary pressure, it's got this remarkable energetics such that it's got, uh, you know, it's the benchmark for specific heat. It takes more energy to be put into a watery solution to change its temperature than just about any other liquid that you would find. And it's the flip side of that is true. You have to take more energy out to reduce the temperature. And that in turn gives rise to this temperature buffering. Mixed in there is this situation where solid water, ice, floats, right? Another kind of temperature buffering you get as a result of that. And boy, I don't know how much more I can beat this to death. Water is just the be all and end all of solvents. There's nothing else that can work quite so well across such a broad spectrum of solutes as water can. When you're talking about solvents, you often find yourself talking about concentrations. So this concept of molarity and pH come into play. pH is a measure of the free hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. pOH is the uh, concentration of the hydroxide ions. pH plus pOH must always equal 14. Okay, so that works for you. Gets us into talking about acids and bases. Low pHs means that you have high hydrogen ion concentration. 
because it's the negative log of the molarity. But a low pH is an acid, a high pH is a base. And I started probably saying a little bit about buffers. So one more time, here's a look at a water molecule. Notice that the water molecule in the middle can make four hydrogen bonds. One hydrogen bond for each of those four other water molecules that it's connected to. And so every water molecule has the capacity to have a friendly, uh, not quite intimate, but friendly, cordial, wanting to hang out with you kind of relationship with four other water molecules. So the focus here is on the one in the middle, but those other four water molecules will each also be interacting with three additional water molecules. So if you were to reach into a watery solution and pull out that water molecule, you'd be dragging along with them to some degree at four other water molecules, and those four other water molecules would each be pulling three other water molecules, and each of those would be pulling three. And so you, you pull one out, and to some extent, you've latched on to the whole bucket of water that you're working with. And again, just when we're talking about pH, uh, I'm sure you've seen on some of the old tests, and I can guarantee you'll see on Thursday I'm going to ask you some pH questions. I don't know, I probably asked too many questions about pH. I think they're too easy, frankly. I think you guys can just plow right through them without thinking about them too much. But bottom line is this, is if you have a high concentration of hydrogen ions, you have a low concentration of hydroxide ions. That's the definition of an acidic solution. Okay, that's going to be a low pH. The reciprocal, or the opposite of that, is a low concentration of hydrogen ions and a high concentration of hydroxide ions. That's a high pH. That's a basic solution. Living things operate, at least for the most part, operate, you and I at the very least, operate in a very narrow pH range. Anything much below 7 and anything much above 8, not good for us, right? Not good to the point of death for, for us, right? So again, fairly narrow pH range that's good for us. And you get outside of that range and you achieve an irrecoverable situation called death. All right. So there's water for you. That's what makes water tick. Let's talk about what makes carbon so special. We are a carbon-based life form. And the reason we're carbon-based is ultimately because carbon can make those four covalent bonds. And uh, that, in turn, lets you dress up some pretty complicated structures. If you could only make one covalent bond, frankly, like hydrogen, there's not that much you can do. You can how, there's not much molecular complexity that you can have. And remember, one of the hallmarks of life is complexity, right? We look for living things to be more complicated than their surroundings. One covalent bond, gee, there's just not that much complexity you can have there. You can only dress up hydrogens so much, right? Ooh, look, I could hook it up with another hydrogen. Ooh, look, I could hook it up with an oxygen only if the oxygen's hooked up with something else. Right? So there's just not that much that you can do if you can only make one covalent bond. Carbon lets you make four, so you can make this long chain of carbons, and you can make it a, a branching chain, and you can dangle all sorts of things off of that chain with all the other opportunities that you have for making covalent bonds. So carbon's capacity to make four covalent bonds turns out to be a, a, a neat feature that living things take a lot of advantage of. So, carbon's bonds. Let's, and then ultimately, here are the things you can dangle off of carbon to dress it up, to give carbon molecules different sort of chemical characteristics, sort of chemical flavors. I've suggested to you that this is sort of like a palette, different shades of colors that you can paint onto the surface of your carbon chain to give those carbon chains different functional abilities. So here is a quick recap of those seven functional groups. Uh, we started with hydroxyl, upper left there, middle is carbonyl, end is carboxyl. So three of the seven are shown on this slide. 
guess what's coming on the next slide, the other four, right? So we'll get all seven of them in the span of the next couple of minutes. For you guys, <clears throat> I appreciate that there's a, a practical urgency that you have. You want to know what exactly should I know for the test on Thursday. To the best of my ability, I want to have that coincide with what it is you should take away from this class in general so that you'll know it for the next two, three years through the next biology classes that you take as well, all right? And so here's what I hope you'll be focusing on and here's what I think it's good for you, not just for Thursday to know, but down the line. I, I apologize, but I think you kind of have to know the structures, right? When somebody says hydroxyl group to you, I don't know that there's any getting around that that's a word that needs to conjure up an image of an oxygen with a hydrogen, right? That's just what a hydroxyl group is. So there's some lame, boring vocabulary. There's no real concept involved there, but you need to know the vernacular. You need to know the words. And that's what a hydroxyl group is, all right? So a hydroxyl group, I hope you'll take away from all this, is simply an oxygen with a hydrogen. It still has one more bond that needs to be made, right? And here we're talking about making that bond to a carbon molecule. When you've tacked a hydroxyl group onto something, some carbon molecule, we now call that molecule an alcohol, right? Again, boring, lame, word, memorization sorts of things, but if you put a hydroxyl group on something, now that something is an alcohol. And when you put a hydroxyl group on something, here's a concept that I hope you can take away from what we've been talking about. That hydroxyl group is going to impart a little bit of hydrophilicity to the molecule. Hydro, water, felicity, friendly. It's going to make the molecule at least a little bit water soluble because water is going to like to rub up against the slight negative charge on the oxygen and the slight positive charge on the hydrogen. That's going to help make this alcohol at least a little bit water soluble. Okay? Three things I think you need to know about hydroxyl. First, hydroxyl means OH. Okay? Second, when you put a hydroxyl group on something, it means it's now an alcohol. And third, and perhaps the most important, it changes the sort of chemical activity, the flavor of the molecule, and it changes it in a way that causes it to be a little bit more water soluble, maybe a little bit more reactive than it was before in the absence of that. So again, there's the concept, and I think you can scratch under the surface here pretty easily to figure out why that concept is what it is. The oxygen is pulling electrons away from the hydrogen. The hydrogen is giving up its electron fairly readily. That causes you to have a partial separation of charge and the water solubility and the interaction between a hydroxyl group and something else sort of just all follows from that. Okay, so three things about hydroxyl groups. I want to say ditto for the next six functional groups. It's the same sort of three things. When somebody says carbonyl to you, I hope that simply conjures up a picture. It's a definition that there's an oxygen that's attached to the carbon chain with a double bond. That's it. That's what a carbonyl group is. So I'm afraid you kind of have to beat that into your head. Carbonyl means oxygen attached by a double bond to a carbon chain. If you've got something that's got a carbonyl group on it, it's going to have one of two kinds of chemical names attached to it. It's a ketone if it's in the middle of the carbon chain, and it's an aldehyde if it's at the end. Sorry. There's no gimmick. There's no trick. We call blue blue for no obvious reason. We call aldehydes aldehydes simply for no reason other than that means that there's a oxygen with a double bond at the end of a carbon chain. So two of the three things. Carbonyl, oxygen with a double bond somewhere on the carbon chain. Ketone or aldehyde, depending where on the carbon chain it is. Last but most important in my mind, what does that do to the chemistry of the molecule? 
that oxygen is going to be pulling electrons toward it away from the carbon. That carbon now is going to be a little bit more greedy for electrons, and it's going to pull them away from the carbons that it's attached to. And so what's going to happen is the oxygen will get a little bit of a negative charge associated with it, and a lot of the rest of that carbon chain is going to get a diffuse positive charge associated with it. Makes it water soluble, right? Not that different from what a, a hydroxyl group would do. One more to the right, carboxyl group. Carboxyl group, first thing, means you've got a carbon that's got two oxygens attached to it plus a hydrogen to one of the oxygens. If you put a carboxyl group on it, on a carbon molecule, second thing, now we call that carbon molecule a carboxylic acid. Okay? Third, most important, what's that going to do to the functionality of that carbon molecule? How's it going to affect the kind of chemical reactions it gets involved with? Well, the way that carboxyl groups usually work is they get ionized, and they'll often have a full negative charge associated with them. The hydrogen just skips time. It's out of there. And you're left then with what, that one oxygen having an extra electron, a full negative charge. <clears throat> so if a hydroxyl group makes you a little bit water soluble, a full negative charge, oh my gosh, water's going to love this. It's got a bunch of hydrogens with a little bit of positive charge that are going to be fighting for a chance to rub up against that full negative charge. Right? It's going to be a really popular person at the party with the water molecules also invited to that party. Okay? So it's going to have a negative charge. It's going to have a high affinity for things that have a positive charge. And so now we've got a, a basis for intra and intermolecular interactions. Right? This, this, is, this negative charge is going to be really popular with things that have a positive charge. And you can bring molecules together that way because of that affinity. All right. Let's hit the last four maybe a little bit more quickly than the first three amino groups. First, it means you've got a nitrogen with some hydrogens dangling off of it. That's what an amino group is. You put an amino group on a carbon compound, and that carbon compound is now called an amine. What does this do to the chemistry? Again, most importantly, how does it affect the molecule? What does this molecule, how does this molecule now behave since you've put an amino group on it? Amino groups often bring with them a positive charge. Okay, that nitrogen sometimes takes on a third proton, and that positive charge then is something that's going to be very attractive to water. The oxygens with their partial negative charge is going to want to rub up against that. That positive charge is also going to be very attractive to negatively charged things like carboxyl groups. Right? So now you've got the basis perhaps for some reactivity and some affinity between one part of a molecule and another part of the molecule or some other molecule altogether. Sulfhydryl groups. Not too much to say about sulfhydryl groups. A sulfhydryl group first is a sulfur with a hydrogen. When you've got a sulfhydryl group on a carbon compound, we call those carbon compounds thiols. Okay. Third, what does it do to the functionality? The sulfhydryl group behaves in many ways like a hydroxyl group. So it imparts a little bit of water solubility. But it also provides the basis for these disulfide bonds, particularly important in the structure of proteins. They are more or less molecular staples that physically link together two different parts of a single protein molecule, sometimes between protein molecules as well. Okay. Phosphate groups. If a carboxyl group brings you a negative charge, I think we need some sort of superlative to put in front of the negative charge that a phosphate group brings. It's a honking negative charge. I don't know. Come up with your own superlative. I think you guys will do better than I will. It's a freaking negative charge. Whatever you like, but it's more than just a negative charge. It's a serious negative charge. So that's what it does to the functionality. The structure is a phosphorus with four oxygens associated with it. It's got a full-blown negative charge, sometimes two negative charges. If you put a phosphate group on a carbon molecule, we call those carbon molecules organic phosphates. That's a pretty easy name. And then lastly, 
number seven on our list. <clears throat> this one's kind of cheating in some sense. All that it is for methyl, a methyl group, when we're talking about a methyl group, we're talking about a carbon that's rounded out with hydrogens. All of its other covalent bonds that it needs to make are made to hydrogen, so you've got a carbon with three hydrogens. Hydrophobic, right? There's no basis for water to interact with this at all, and uh, that's, that's what it does in terms of the chemical flavor. And does it have an AMO? I guess we could say that if you put a methyl group on something, we've methylated it. It's kind of awkward to say you've methylated a carbon molecule itself, but you could methylate a protein, you could methylate a histone, you could methylate a lipid, I suppose. We'll talk more about methylation later in the class. So that name doesn't really fit quite the way the others have been fitting for the other six compounds. All right. Now, you can take these carbon molecules and you can string them together to make prodigiously large <coughs> things <coughs> through this process of polymerization. And in terms of polymers, I think the next image is going to show you how it is you string together these polymers. A polymer is a long chain of simple subunits that got linked together. We talk about four major biopolymers. Frankly, I would love it if you guys could enlighten me as to a fifth biopolymer. I can't dredge one up. I think there are only four polymers that living things are in the business of making. I, don't, I seriously don't know of a fifth. I can't help but think that there must be a fifth. But it gives you a sense of how important these four are that the fifth on the roster a full professor of biology needs to be reminded. I've never, I can't recall anybody ever talking with me about a fifth biopolymer. There are four <laughs> biopolymers that we want to worry about for a biology class. And the, the ones that we talked about were carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and amino acids. So we started with the carbohydrates, we went on to the lipids, then the proteins, and then the uh, nucleotides. Um, for all four of these biopolymers, and it's true for things that aren't biopolymers, like nylon as well, what you're doing is you take a simple subunit and you repeat it. You link it together and you, you repeat it many times. So for any polymer, I hope you'll remember a couple of things. For these four biopolymers, I hope you'll remember what the subunit is, what the monomer is called. For a carbohydrate, the monomer is a sugar. It's a monosaccharide, okay? I hope you'll also remember the name of the bond that connects one subunit to the next subunit. For a sugar, that's a glycosidic bond. Again, I apologize, there's no logic to that name. That's just the name. I think you need to have that in your head so that someday down the line, if somebody says glycosidic linkage, you'll think, oh, they're talking about the bond between one sugar and another sugar in a carbohydrate. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And then third, and this applies for all of them, when you add a subunit on to a chain, you do it through a dehydration reaction or a condensation reaction. They're the same. They mean the same thing. Dehydration, condensation reaction. What that means is you kick a water molecule out. When you break up a biopolymer or a non-biopolymer like nylon, you do it through a hydrolysis. You have to bring a water molecule in to break that bond that connects one monomer to the next. And you always do this from the ends of the molecules. You add sugars on to the ends. You don't come into the middle and expand out. They're always being added on, tacked on to the ends. So for we've, we've done one of the four already. Here's what a sugar looks like. Uh, I hope you guys are fairly comfortable with these kinds of structures. I'm going to be drawing some of these out on the test for you with a paper and pencil. Uh, these are all equivalent structures. Well, at least, yeah, these are equivalent structures to a chemist. 
So you can see this is a six carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, cleverly named, uh, six carbon molecule. It's a carbohydrate because you've got carbon and water all over, H2O for every carbon. You've got an oxygen and two hydrogens. And these structures tend to fold up on themselves in a watery solution. And you can abbreviate that structure like this where you simply don't bother drawing the carbons. They kind of get in the way and make this picture more complicated than it needs to be. So those are the carbohydrates. One monosaccharide can get tacked on to another monosaccharide, and you get a disaccharide. Put one more subunit on another monosaccharide, you get a trisaccharide. One gets connected to the other by a glycosidic linkage. Now, let's move on to a second biopolymer. Let's talk about the lipids. I think lipids just sort of barely sneak in under the wire as being a biopolymer. They're the least prodigious in terms of their complexity to the biopolymers. But what's going on with lipids is these guys are fatty acids that get attached to a triacyl glycerol. Well, it's a glycerol, and you put three uh, fatty acids on, and it makes it a triacyl glycerol. And so this is the glycerol, this is the fatty acid. You can have this chain be of different lengths between one fatty acid and another. If you've got nothing but carbon to hydrogen bonds, that's going to make this very hydrophobic. <clears throat> Here, this structure is meant to make you think that for every carbon at each of those kinks, there are two hydrogens. That's called a saturated fat because it's saturated with hydrogens. There's no more room for any more hydrogens in that structure. It's saturated for hydrogen. Saturated fats uh, tend to be solid at room temperature. They're butter. Butter is rich in saturated fats. That's in contrast to something like this, where here you've got a double bond uh, between some carbons that's unsaturated because instead of having the carbons have two hydrogens coming off of each of them, now there's just one hydrogen coming off of each of them and that other bond is made in common between the two carbons, so there's a double bond. You can see that puts a kink into the chain. The kink in that chain makes it hard to pack these things together. They're buttoned up against each other and poking around. That tends to make them liquid at room temperature. Oil in everyday usage. If you want to talk about a polyunsaturated fat, all that means is that there are multiple double bonds along this chain. There's more than one. So this is a monounsaturated fat. Let's get away from lipids and start talking about something kind of interesting. <clears throat> Here, this is the subunit that you string together to make a protein. That's a fairly simple structure, uh, rep representation of an amino acid. Every amino acid has a central carbon. If you want to be really sophisticated, you call it the alpha carbon. Okay? But dangling off of that alpha carbon are four things. An amine group, a carboxylic acid, a hydrogen, and something else. Okay? The something else here is abbreviated as R, short for reactive group. Uh, there's 20 different things that we find living things on the planet commonly use as that reactive group. That determines which amino acid, which of the 20 amino acids we're talking about. The simplest, R, is nothing but another hydrogen. That amino acid has a name. It's called glycine. Right? There are 19 others. Off the top of my head, I don't know that I could dredge up the structure of any of the other 19. You guys don't have to either. Okay? Don't worry about that, but recognize that structure. That's the subunit. String together one amino acid onto another amino acid. You've got a dipeptide, a third, a tripeptide. We're starting to make a protein. The bond that connects one amino acid to another amino acid is called a peptide bond. Okay? There's no practical limit to how long this polymer can be. Um, in practice, though, a typical protein will be a few hundred amino acids long. 
And the way that that protein behaves is going to be determined essentially by what the sequence of R groups are that got strung together. Here are the structures for all 20 of those R groups. One more time, what I hope you guys can do is if I give you one of those R groups, I'm not expecting you to tell me what the name of the amino acid is. I'm expecting you to simply be able to tell me, simply, right? You guys be the judge. I want you guys to be able to tell me what kind of chemical flavor that amino acid is going to impart to that part of the protein. Four different categories, by my way of thinking. Some of those amino acids impart a little bit of hydrophobicity, phobic. They're afraid of water. They want nothing to do with water. So if you look at those at the top of the screen, those are nonpolar side chains, nonpolar R groups. There's nothing going on there but carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds. Couple of small exceptions. You'll see methionine has a sulfur. You'll see tryptophan has a nitrogen. But those are embedded in very hydrophobic places. And these are hydrophobic R groups. A second category are the hydrophilic R groups, where now we've got some polar bonds. We've got some oxygens going on there and a couple of nitrogens in a few places. These guys are going to impart a little bit of hydrophilicity, friendly toward water. And then the third and fourth category, you could combine into one and simply say these are electrically charged. I like to parse them out a bit further. There are two that have negative charges associated with them, and there are three that have positive charges associated with them. The ones with the positive charges have as part of their R group amines. The ones that are negatively charged have part of their R group as a carboxylic acid. Okay? The sequence with which amino acids get strung together is the primary sequence of the protein. That, in turn, dictates or puts, uh, uh, makes it likely that a secondary structure will form alpha helices or beta sheets. Those alpha helices and beta sheets are the beginning of a three-dimensional structure, but they in turn cause bends and twists in the structure of the molecule that give a three-dimensional structure that we call the tertiary structure. And then if you have one protein that needs to do its thing by interacting with another protein, those now start to be quaternary structures. So if a protein is interacting, touching it against another protein in a fairly stable relationship, that starts to be what we call a quaternary uh, structure for that protein. Here are my personal favorites. These are nucleic acids. Here are the monomers are nucleotides the bond that holds one monomer to another monomer. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The bond that holds one monomer to another monomer is called a phosphodiester bond. There is no practical limit to how long this polymer can be. We have examples inside of all of our cells where we have chromosomes that have hundreds of millions of nucleotides that got strung together, one monomer after another, each with a phosphodiester bond. There are four different kinds of nucleotides. There are, well, maybe five, depending on what you're talking about. For DNA, there are four, cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. For RNA, there are four, cytosine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. There are two basic categories of nitrogenous bases in the nucleotides that get made from them. There are pyrimidines, which have just one ring, and there are purines that are bicyclic. There are two rings associated with them. For Thursday's test, I hope that if I were to ask you which of these structures is a pyrimidine, and if I gave you this and this and this and this and this, that you would come away saying, oh, that's a nitrogenous base. These aren't. This has one ring. Pyrimidines have one ring. These have two. This must be the right answer. That's the level at which I hope you'll be able to wrestle with those kinds of structures. Don't have to memorize them per se. If you do memorize them, 
you'll save yourself about 30 seconds at that question when it comes up. But that's the working sort of understanding that I hope you'll have. Later on, it's going to be important for you to appreciate that on one side of a double-stranded DNA molecule, you'll have a purine. Opposite, you'll have a pyrimidine, right? So that's why I kind of need you to be comfortable with the idea that one has one ring, the other has two. And we'll talk more about why it is that Gs like to interact with Cs and As like to interact with Ts or Us. Okay? So that's the whole polymer spiel. Oh my gosh, how much longer is this going to take? Right? I didn't think I was going to have to work here today. But then we started talking about cellular anatomy, right? Big deal here for this is this. In a word, prokaryotes are simple. They're bags of goo. A big part of the bag of goo is that it holds a chromosome or two or three sometimes. And that's about it. Simple. Especially in comparison to a eukaryotic cell, which is, in a word, complicated. What makes a eukaryotic cell complicated compared to a prokaryotic cell is that eukaryotic cells have internal membrane-bound compartments. First and foremost, probably the nucleus. Okay, that's where the chromosomes are stored. Moving out from the nucleus, uh, you've got things like the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough, followed by the smooth, and then the Golgi apparatus. There's protein synthesis that can happen in the rough ER as well as in the cytoplasm. Uh, there's membrane synthesis that happens in the smooth ER and the Golgi apparatus itself. Okay? You have other membrane-bound compartments like the mitochondria and the chloroplasts and the lysosomes and the peroxisomes. And there are actually more beyond that, but not stuff that we talk about in this class. And lastly, last Thursday, I talked with you a little bit about the structure of membranes. Our cell membranes, prokaryotic cell membranes, archibacteria cell membranes, all are the same. They're phospholipid bilayers. So phospholipids are, in a word, amphipathic. That's a nice way of not insulting a phospholipid because you could pretty much also say they're schizophrenic. Schizophrenic and amphipathic, I think in some sense here are interchangeable. Amphipathic means that one part of the molecule is hydrophilic and another part of the molecule is hydrophobic. A phospholipid has a phosphate group attached to a glycerol, it's very hydrophilic, and two lipids attached to that glycerol, very hydrophobic. The way that phospholipids end up is they form these bilayers where you have the hydrophobic region that is excluding water and you have the water-friendly phosphate parts poking out, one side to the exterior of the cell, one to the interior of the cell. Embedded and bobbing around in this sea of phospholipids are proteins. These proteins will have hydrophobic R groups on the parts that are in the transmembrane region, the part that spans this hydrophobic part, and they'll have hydrophilic R groups either on the exterior of the cell or poking down into the interior of the cell. Those proteins play a really important role in the sense that they're the gates through which molecules come in and go out of cells to a large extent. Water has a hard time punching its way through a phospholipid bilayer. To get water into a cell or to get water out of a cell, a protein gets invoked. It's a gate. The protein also acts not just as a gate, but also as the gatekeeper. And it can, depending on how the protein gets modified, either let no water pass, let water go in outward direction, or let water go in an inward direction, or let water go both ways. All right, so depending on how you modify the protein, that protein can have a different activity. The same is true for sugars, like glucose. The same is true for amino acids, like glycine. Um, there are these proteins that will facilitate the transport. 
or at least allow the transport. So here you can see there's two kinds of transports that are being described. One of them is passive transport. The difference between passive and active transport is that in passive transport, you're going down a concentration gradient. You go from high concentration to low concentration. With active transport, energy is being expended in the form of burning ATPs, often to drive things against a concentration gradient, to go from high concentration to even higher concentration, or to go from low concentration to high concentration. I'm done. <laughs> so what was that? So why did you guys come for the first three weeks of class? You could have just sat through this and the whole, that's the whole story, right? There's, there you go. That's uh, three weeks worth of talkings distilled down into uh, whatever, about an hour. At this point, I am happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. We've got a good half hour here. If you want to leave, this is a great chance to walk away. If you want to stick around and ask questions, I'll, be, I'll do my best to answer them. You're going to need to talk loudly, but okay, you'll need to talk louder than that. Let me come closer to you, and then I'll transmit to everybody else. All right, so this question is about electronegativity. What's the most electronegative element? I understand. Let me see if I can dredge up the PowerPoint again. Yeah. So there's a, a question on an old test, and there's, there's a question now from a student that says, which of these is the most electronegative atom? I, I think, well, I would, I, I'd like to recall that question and rephrase it and say, which of these atoms is most likely to have a negative charge associated with it, all right? So I think that sort of settles that right away. But by my way of, <coughs> by my way of wrestling with these kinds of questions. I'm looking to see how close you are to filling the outermost shell and how close you are to empty, emptying the outermost shell of electrons. Uh, if you've got an atom like chlorine that needs just one more electron to round out, to completely fill its outermost shell, to me that translates to this guy is going to be you know, voracious for electrons. It's going to pull them away from just about anything else. And about the only thing that's going to be able to give it a good fight is something else that's one electron shot. And that's in stark contrast to something like sodium, where you've got just one electron in the outermost shell, hanging out there all by itself, far, far away from the nucleus. Sodium is a pushover when it comes to electrons. It's so much more comfortable for sodium to just give away that electron and take on a positive charge than it is for it to pull in another seven electrons and fill out its outermost shell. Nature wants that outermost shell of electrons to either be completely empty or completely full. And so which of the two is more likely to have a negative charge, sodium or chloride? Oh my gosh, it's chloride because that's why, right, what I just explained. Carbon is half full, half empty. It's got a roughly equivalent affinity for electrons as hydrogen does, which is also half empty and half full. And so when you're looking at structures like these, that sort of rule of thumb, that kind of thinking, works awfully well. Here we've got nonpolar covalent bonds because they're both half empty, both half full. Here we've got nonpolar covalent bonds because all of these four bonds are between things that are both half empty and both half full. Here, nonpolar, because they both have the same level of voraciousness for electrons. They're fighting over them equally, but that's going to make this nonpolar covalent bonds. But here, we've got a scenario where we've got oxygen that's three quarters of the way full and one quarter of the way empty, and hydrogen that's half full, half empty. The hydrogen's going to spend more time by that oxygen than it is by the that's right. The electron is going to spend more time by the oxygen than it will by the hydrogen. 
you'll get a negative charge associated, a partial negative charge associated with the oxygen, and a partial positive charge with the hydrogen. Okay. So that's that's where, where I'm going with those kinds of questions. Yeah. I think that uh, what I've just said in answer to that first question should cover anything that would come up with respect to, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm more interested in <clears throat> can you predict is this going to be a polar covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond, or is it going to have a full negative charge or a full positive charge? So that's what I'm really after. That's the concept that I'm hoping you guys can work with. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> I need help from you guys. <clears throat> you guys, you know, this isn't just one way. You guys got to help me here. Every year, every year, people in your chairs get worried about their, you know, how cool is it we get to look at all of these old tests and then they look at the old tests and they see that for a small fraction, you know, four or five questions, oh no, there's no answer. <laughs> <laughs> and you gloss right over the fact that for 40 of the questions, oh yeah, it's all there and all their glory, de de glorious detail. But, and, and I tried to forestall that each year, apparently completely ineffectively. At the very first lecture when I say, look at the old tests, now there are going to be some spots there that I haven't written in the, the structures because these are Microsoft Word files. And the structures are hand drawn by a little old me, and I can't get that transmitted into the Microsoft Word file. It's just literally hand drawn in terms of what it is that gets uh, printed. So don't, I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you. Don't freak out. Those, those spots that are empty are empty because I had to write something in by hand. I have absolutely no idea what I wrote in by hand. <laughs> right? Oh, you absolutely have to worry about them. <laughs> but there is no way that I can tell you what those structures were. And, and I'm tired of all the emails from students that are asking me for those structures because I don't have them. <laughs> and I can't help you. And so there are a couple of questions that uh, I get from students in this class that I, I'm inclined to just get a rubber stamp for. Right? And this is one of those. I don't have those structures. But, but I still think that's cool because you don't need me, you can come up with those structures. So for the one that you were just asking me about, you know, which of these is a hydrophobic, I think, or hydrophilic, I don't care. Let's pretend it's hydrophobic. Which of these R groups is for a hydrophobic amino acid? Hydrophobic are the ones at the top in yellow. I could have written in any one of those, what, one, two, three, four, five, nine different structures in yellow. Any one of those should have been one of the four or five choices. And any of the others in teal, purple, or blue could have been the remaining three or four. Right? You don't need me to write that down. I, I will, for the test, I'll write down CH3, and I'll write down you know, OH and CH2. Right? But you guys can kind of fill in the blanks there. You don't need my pretty structures to do it, but that's that's what you should expect is going to be there. I, I was telling a couple of students who came by to see me in my office hours earlier this morning, I really wrestle that some of those questions are things like, which of these is not a plausible structure, right? Or which of these is a plausible structure amongst those that are. I have a hard time coming up with 
incorrect structures. <laughs> it's like fingernails on chalkboards to me. I can't write them out. It just doesn't feel right. Uh, you guys will be better at writing incorrect structures than I will be. <laughs> <laughs> because I just can't make them plausible. I look at them and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to think this could possibly be a correct structure. But that's what's going on with those questions. I'm writing stuff in by hand. Uh, and for that particular one you asked, I'm drawing from this table to, to do it. Yes. Well, remember a carboxyl group. A carboxyl group is a carbon with a double bonded oxygen and a hydrogen. You know, sometimes the hydrogen there, uh, a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen, sometimes that oxygen has a hydrogen on it, sometimes it doesn't. With or without, that's the ionized form of a carboxyl. Yes? Yeah. The, the two negatively charged amino acid R groups both have carboxyl groups. The three positively charged amino acid R groups all have amine groups associated with them. Yeah? Maybe this one would help. I don't think it does. Ah, I got a good one for it. So many things I could work with. But let's talk about this. So the question was, which is the, which, I, I'm going to draw out a structure for you. I'm going to have a bunch of arrows, A, B, C, D, and E, five arrows. And I'm going to ask which of the five arrows in this instance is pointing to a polar covalent bond. So how about if I have an arrow pointing right there? That's a polar covalent bond. How about if I have an arrow pointing right there? That's a nonpolar covalent bond. How about if I have an arrow pointing there? Nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, right there, actually, nonpolar covalent bond. How about right there? Nonpolar covalent bond. So that's, that's how it would work in that sort of scenario. So you guys don't have to worry about this. This is just for his edification. But if you want to be edified too, we'll do it right now. So each of the 20 amino acids has a name. One of them is called glutamic acid. This one is glutamic acid. Notice that glutamic acid has a carboxyl group associated with it. A salt of glutamic acid could be a sodium ion hanging out with that negatively charged oxygen. So there's one sodium, mono sodium glutamate, it's the salt of an acid, instead of calling it an acid, now we call it an eight. <clears throat> so <clears throat> glutamate is a salt of glutamic acid. So you can use that to flavor your food. Yes? <laughs> Uh, so if I'm asking what the subunits are that get linked together to make a protein, the short answer is an amino acid. And if there's nothing, if there are no choices there, that probably means that I drew out that structure. And I gave you some other ringers like a sugar and a nucleic acid and a methyl group <laughs> or something really weird. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's a mystery. <laughs> God likes it that way. I don't have a good answer for you. But yeah, so nitrogen makes has the capacity to make three covalent bonds because it has three unpaired electrons. But nitrogen also has this ability to, to accommodate a free proton, right? And it just hangs out there, nestled in with all the rest of what's going on, and that free proton brings a positive charge. And so amino groups often have those hydrogens that hang out there. Not really involved in a covalent bond per se, it's just hanging out and giving it a positive charge. For the nitrogenous bases, what I hope you'll be able to do is there we are, know the difference between a pyrimidine and a purine. Right? Just to, at a glance, purines have two rings, pyrimidines have one. Um, be able to recognize that as a nitrogenous base as opposed to that, right? You know, so some fairly superficial recognition as to what they are. I don't expect you to know the difference between cytosine and thymine, right? I expect you to know that they are different. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice if you had a sense of the kind of differences, right? The nitrogen up here, the oxygen, the methyl group over there. Just, you know, know that they are different and that there's no great mystery. It's not a really trivial thing, but I don't expect you to memorize them for this test. So if hydro groups tend to, they make the, the molecule a little bit hydrophilic, much the same way that a hydroxyl group would. those functional groups. These, I suspect. So something that has a full charge, let alone two full charges, is going to be much more attractive than something that has just a partial charge to water. All right? So that full nature pours separation charge. It just can't stand separation of charge. It wants there to be no separation of charge whatsoever. Curious, because nature also really doesn't like to have unfilled outermost shells of electrons, right? And so it's playing with these two different sort of competing rules. In the circumstances where you do get one of these full negative charges, nature wants to muzzle that. They want to, you know, hide it as effectively as they can by bringing in things that have positive charge. So if you could bring in an amine group, boy, that would be the best scenario. If there's no amine group available, then water with its partial positive charges can mute that full negative charge. And so it's got a really strong attraction to water. Nature likes water hanging out there. That's going to be more water soluble than something that just has a, a weak positive or negative charge. What's that? A hydroxyl group would be, a hydroxyl group makes a molecule water soluble. A phosphate group makes it really water soluble. And amine makes it really water soluble too. Maybe not as water soluble as a phosphate group because the phosphate group often has two charges as opposed to one. But either a negative charge or a positive charge, a full electrical charge, very attractive to water. These are four of them. So you want the seven of those? Yes. So if, it, if you ask which of the following functional groups does not play a yes. important role, would none of those be on there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a lot of 
there i'm going to give you sort of a multiple choice question where i say which of these does not play an important role i'll give you four or three of these seven and then one that i've got to make up that i try to have look sort of like it might be one of those but isn't one of those so three of those will be there if yeah the right answer is going to be something other than one of those seven So how can you tell if something's hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Um, well, here we go. Here's water. And the question, in other words, is what kind of molecule would water like to interact with? Water has an itch that needs to be scratched. Okay, It's got a couple itches. Each water molecule has three itches that need to be scratched. It's got two positive charged things that just don't feel quite right. And that would make them feel much better is if they could be bumping up against something with a little bit of a negative charge. Okay? And it's got this partial negative charge on the oxygen. And it doesn't feel quite right. What would make it feel better is if it could rub up against something with a little bit of a positive charge or maybe a whole positive charge. So water is friendly toward things that can scratch those itches, right? It wants to find something that's got a little bit of positive charge that it can rub its oxygen up against, something that's got a little bit of a negative charge that it can rub its hydrogens up against, okay? Something that has no charge, water has no interest in it, no interest in it. It does nothing to help water's problems. If so, hydrophobic molecules are things that have no separation of charge, nonpolar covalent bonds. Hydrophilic things have polar covalent bonds or full charge, salt kind of things. Now, I don't think there's anybody that comes in this room after this class, so we can stick around longer if you like, but I'm going to turn the recording off in about two, three minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't have any pictures of cells. I, it, it's too hard for me to copy and paste them into the exams, so I don't do that. <laughs> If I took more time to make the exams, I'd do that, but I don't. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much all you need. Um, so, yeah, if, if carp, let me get you a structure. So here, you got a bunch of bonds, right? The only thing that's missing is there's no nitrogens in this structure, but anywhere you've got a carbon to hydrogen bond, that's a nonpolar bond. Anywhere there's a carbon to carbon bond, that's a nonpolar bond. Anywhere you've got a carbon to oxygen bond, that's a polar bond. Anywhere you've got a oxygen to hydrogen bond, that's a polar bond. What about a carbon to nitrogen? Is that a nonpolar? Carbon to nitrogen. It doesn't happen. It happens. <laughs> so if you tacked an amine group on, you could take that hydrogen off and you could put a amine group there. What's going to happen there is carbon needs four to round out its valence. Nitrogen needs three to round out its valence. And so Isn't the. There charge? There'll be a little separation of charge between carbon and nitrogen. But the amine group has this tendency to just take on a whole other proton, and that sort of swamps out anything else that's going on. So the amine group usually has a uh, positive charge associated with it that sort of is separate and apart from these other stories. So then because it has a partial positive charge, like if you had an amine group connected to a carbon, that mm -hmm. molecule section if, if in you its put an amine is going to be a partial charge? If you put an amine group on a carbon chain, that uh, carbon chain is going to have a positive charge associated with the amine group. 
And I don't think you have to worry too much at that point if there is a little separation of charge between the carbon and the nitrogen because the nitrogen's got this flaming positive charge that sort of masks or swamps out anything else that might be going on. Okay, right, guys, I'm going off mic, but if you want to ask more questions, I'll be around for as long as you need. Okay, so I know we, we kind of kicked this dead horse over and over again.